Okay. Hey everybody, it's Tabitha. I am here with an EMDR expert. We're going to talk a little bit about what EMDR is, who may benefit from it, and how many stages and uh, levels there are to EMDR, different types. So come on in if you think that might be a therapy you're interested in. Welcome back, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. We're in season three, and we're talking a lot about modalities during this season because when you start healing from complex trauma, it's important to know what your options are. Um, as always, please share, like, save, subscribe, whatever you do to support digital information traveling far and wide because we'd like to spread this information for free as far as we can. My guest today is Amy Vita Colonna, who is an EMDR expert. And if you've heard our podcast before, EMDR, we've just talked about it a lot, um, Amy, because this is a fantastic modality for a lot of people to get support and recovery. So EMDR um, stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And um, Amy, you are a EMDR coach, meaning you have clients that you support. And you also support people who are in the process of being trained to be EMDR providers. So with your wealth of information, would you tell us a little bit about what EMDR is and then who is a good candidate for EMDR? Yeah, I would love to. So EMDR, like you said, is a modality to process through complex trauma. But the neat thing about EMDR is you only really have to have a negative core belief, which I think is very widespread. And, you know, um, ev across the board, everybody could say that they have had a negative belief at some point in their life. And so EMDR is really um, a bilateral stimulation form mm -hmm. of therapy so that you can process through maladaptive beliefs and you get to the other side. It helps you to get not only relief, but distance from the trauma, the negative belief, and helps you process through in a productive way and helps you to just get to the other side of what you're struggling with. So it's, it's great. It is great. And when you say bilateral stimulation or a bilateral modality, what you mean yes. is that stimulation is being provided to both sides of your body and brain. Is that a good right. way to yes. summarize that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And you can do with eye movements, you can do tapping on the shoulders, tapping on the knees, and you can also do it simultaneously with your um, toes and your knees, and then as well as um, what they're called buzzies, where they buzz on both sides. So yeah. I've never heard them called buzzies. I like that. It seems friendly like somehow. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, EMDR therapy can be um, a really, really deep dive into yeah. healing uh, because of all of those negative core beliefs. And sometimes those, as you know, core beliefs cluster and right. EMDR is great at finding clusters or aspects of different things. So right. who is a good candidate? Yeah. So good candidates for EMDR is, like I said, if you have any um, negative core beliefs, if you are stuck, if you have, um, you know, yes, complex trauma, but it's really, it's really widespread bigger than that because um, anybody really can benefit. And I think that that's, what's so great about EMDR is that um, really it's, it's across the board beneficial to anybody. I don't think anybody's really not a candidate for EMDR. I agree with you. I agree with you on that, Amy. And while our focus here on this podcast is complex trauma, Yes. Absolutely. I've seen EMDR used for performance enhancement. Right. Right. And so even if you are stuck in your golf swing, yes. EMDR might be a candidate for you. Yes, absolutely. And I've seen clients from first responders to complex trauma, sexual trauma. Um, I've, you know, um, obviously PTSD and um, yeah, so a wide range of clientele and I just, I think that the case presentation symptoms um, that they're coming with is really the, um, what we're going after is the reduction of the symptoms presentations that they have. So it can be very focused. Very focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes. for those of us um, who haven't read a book on EMDR or followed anything, yeah. when we would walk into a session, let's say with you. 
Um, mm -hmm. And you've done the assessment, so we're ready to start the work. That kind of right. that kind of session. Yeah. What would that look like typically? Typically, yeah. So there's eight phases of EMDR, and there's three stages. So it um, when you first come in and get you know case history, I like to call it the EMDR ear. And so I have attuned my ear to listen to negative core beliefs, to listen to those areas that are stuck stuck points whether it's um, resistance, whether it's avoidance, whether it's blocking beliefs at the beginning, I'm just always listening. So right at, you know, right at hello. And um, so then we go into state or phase two, which is resourcing. And resourcing is all about really getting the client to be able to have that affect shift. So as they're able to get that affect shift going and also work on it between sessions, which is which we have resources called the container, peaceful place, securing your space, and breathing techniques that are essential to keep the client within their window of tolerance. Because the most um, the the most oh what's the word I'm looking for um oh gosh um sorry um I'm, who hasn't been yes, there I'm a lost word so um the most um resistance that I've seen with utilizing EMDR from therapists is their clients going out of their window of tolerance. Yes. So what I like to do is um, really make sure that they can stay within that. And then there's also some titrated or smaller, um, which is not actually EMDR, but it's called CID or ATIP, which is critical incident processing and acute trauma processing. So that helps them um, for those um, acute individual uh, traumas. So it's also used. So. Very great. I, I would like to talk a little bit more about resourcing because I really do think that this is a step that um, a lot of generalized therapists or therapies ignore. Um, like I, when I was learning the cognitive behavioral therapy, which I don't really practice yeah. too much. I mean, elements of it because it's in thinking, right. Mm -hmm. But I was never taught about resourcing. It was like, you go in there and get it. And uh, that can leave people feeling really overwhelmed or empty or hollow or right. just outside of that window of tolerance that you're talking about. Right. So I, it, would it be all right with you if we talk a little bit about exactly what that window of tolerance is? Because a lot of people don't know what that is. And then why it's important to stay in that, especially during treatment. I mean, at all times, I think, but right. during treatment, we really don't want that fluctuation. Right. Yeah. So your window of tolerance is really um, within your, the, the client's ability to stay within where they want to go and that they are grounded and so that they can feel like they're in control. And so one of the misconceptions of EMDR is like, is that it's um, they they're outside of their own self control, and it's not true. Right. And so they stay within with within um, not only the boundaries of their window tolerance, and it's also um, be able to be able to go into a trauma without over accessing it. So, um, and then there's a lot of interventions, interweaves, I know that's a clinical term, but um, to help the client get through, if in fact it does happen, because, you know, there, there are situations, um, not necessarily their window of tolerance, because we kind of keep that um, titrated, but it's, it's as far as seeing something that they don't want to. So we stop, put in the container, do that resourcing and bring them back, back down. So with my, um, the way I was trained and my philosophy with EMDR is to really be client centered and to keep them where they want to go. And so we have a, a conversation about it. What, you know, cause sometimes people are motors or they cry and that's fine because that's therapy, you know, that happens. Um, but some people don't want to, and mm -hmm. they want to go in slower. And so we really keep it, um, really restricted. And so with them, with them, um, the training that I was trained in with Roy Kiesling, he's really, um, keeps what's called a restricted EMD, EMD, little R and EMD are unrestricted. And so there's three ways, and it's kind of an accordion approach where you open up their, um, their neural network, and then you close it down 
depending on exactly what we're saying. So there's a specific script that we say to keep them within their window of tolerance and then open it back up in that neural network so that they can process without, um, without us stepping in. So you just keep on asking them, keep going, what do you notice and keep going and then, you know, let their brain do the work. Yeah. One of the things I really love that you were just talking about, about EMDR, especially when it's done correctly, because, you know, every, everybody, everybody practices at a different level, but the way that EMDR can guide you through the process itself is kind of like those bumpers you put in a bowling alley. So there's, they're not really redirecting it. Just like, nope, you wanted to stay here. Nope. You wanted to stay here. And it's a very gentle um, boundary really. And they bounce back into their own regulation. What you're talking about is also the way I was trained, as you know, Um, with uh, that material, I really would like to talk about the different ways that this particular training categorizes the material, because the one complaint I hear um, and validly about EMDR and some other somatic but mind uh, body integrations is that it can go too fast. And so, and not only are we out of that window of tolerance, we've blown out of therapy. Right. Right. So could you, would you mind just talking about the different levels of Uh, restriction and how that opens up over time. Yeah, absolutely. So with um, the most restrictive, like I said um, before, is called EMD. So it's, um, it's the most restricted because it's only the desensitization and you, you get the left brain, you have the left brain engaged. And so you're only asking for um, the numbers to keep them um, connected with like zero to 10. Think of the incident what do you notice? I mean, and then, so with that, you're just keeping on the incident with, um, with, um, EMD little R you're asking them to stay with the, um, incident. And then what do you notice with the incident? So you're not asking them zero to 10 because that, um, connects them only with the, um, the numbers and reducing and EMD unrestricted is opening up the whole neural network. And so they can go anywhere within it. I kind of look at it like an elevator. So you're pushing the elevator button. Where are you going to go? It's still in the same building, but where you get off is always different. Or you can look at the analogy of an accordion. So you're opening up the accordion and letting them to to go, um, you know, open it up. And then the neural network, you close it back down. And so that's really the the way it flows from restricted to unrestricted processing. And the the restricted processing and then the further unrestriction is for client safety. And that's right. really important, right? And it's right. it's a it's actually a loving stance to take, I think, yes. because yeah. if you start opening trauma that you are either not prepared to process you as a client audience. I'm talking to you when you open trauma that you're not prepared to process, it is overwhelming and re-traumatizing. And that's one of the things that this particular stance can help is to keep it, to help you stay in a window of safety where you feel secure. And I really think that's also reinforcing in the relationship with you as a therapist or a coach, because, um, because you're trustworthy. Yes. Right. And that scaling that you're talking about zero to 10 is really, really important because that helps us understand client experience as therapists. And it also helps the client understand their experience without having to put words to it. Right. I agree. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, I was just saying that I agree with you. I think you said it beautifully. And um, I, it's really important for the client to stay not only grounded, but comfortable that, um, and there are a lot of things that come up, like I said, avoidance, blocking beliefs, um, and, you know, secondary gain, positive affect. There's a lot of those things that we can, we can help them with to keep them processing. Mm -hmm. My favorite um, lately has been attachment um, informed EMDR, because, you know, if, as we have seen um, with, with a lot of the research right now is repairing that ruptured attachment. And so the attachment um, approach, I think is brilliant. 
As do I. And audience, if you're interested in understanding what that is a little more, you can either visit Amy, of course, but Laura Parnell has written a lot of information about attachment-oriented EMDR. Um, and for those of you who have not listened to this podcast before, the reason we're talking about attachment is because it governs how we view ourselves and ourselves in relationship. And there are different kinds of attachment. So please Google that um, because we're going to stick with the EMDR. <laughs> right. So I, if you're willing, Amy, I would like to go back to the resourcing again, because yeah. one of one of the things I've noticed, and I absolutely specialize in complex trauma. And so that's who I see. And one thing I think that frustrates clients frequently is they don't really have a grasp of how long it can take to get resourced. Right. Right. And, and they want to move forward. They want, and I understand because I want to rip it out too. <laughs> right. But right. ripping it out is not therapeutic. Right. And so I'm wondering if you would lead us through an example or an idea of what the one I love the most is the container. Yes. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that and, uh, yeah. and go for it. Absolutely. So, yeah. So the container is a resource that's utilized to help the client, um, put away something that they are really um, stuck on and also compartmentalizing so that they can put it away when they're not ready to look at it. So the resource that um, the container is, you know, you, you just free associate and design and let your creativity go. And what is a container? Um, what can it can hold? There's an entrance and an exit of your container. What shape, what size, what color do you want it to be? How strong do you want it to be? You can be as creative as you want because the whole purpose is, is that, you know, the inside is amazing and nothing would want to leave. And, you know, and so it helps them to, to just put, put away things that are, are just too activating. Mm -hmm. And um, also it's really important for the client to with between sessions to utilize it. Yes. And so that's when you know that they're ready to process is when they come back in and say, Amy, I use the container and it worked so well. And I just saw the shift. And, and then um, as we're learning the container, we do slow tapping. So we do fast tapping when you're processing and that's phase four and um, slow tapping when you're tapping in a resource. So. Yeah. And I just, this isn't part of the training that I received. So this is just my nugget. If you disagree, fine, no problem. Yeah, but yeah. I think that slow tap when we tap in is really softening our vagal system. Right. Really, And so that the good can go in and the empowerment can go in because when you've lived a life of highly activated nervous system, it's hard to right. let negative core beliefs go because they've saved your life. Right. Right. Yeah. And to replace them. Yes. So Go ahead. Oh, I was just, I agree with you. And I think that it's really important to, to know that um, the clients, whatever your brain is doing to help you to survive as long as they have, then you have to be careful to not take what I call the blanket down too far because yeah. they feel, I mean, I've had clients um, or clinicians um, who have caught, who have, consulted with me of uh, why does my client shake? Why did this happen? Why did they dissociate? Why, you know, because it was too much. And so the other thing that you can do as well to help them stay restricted is to lower the sets. So that bilateral stimulation is, is literally just tapping on each side of your body. And then you pause and depending on which, um, which restricted, unrestricted or um, contained, then you just ask them what they notice and, and bring it up. So it's a little bit more complex than that. Cause there's eight phases and three stages, like I said before, but the basic concept of EMDR, um, is to help them to process through that neural network. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you're willing to take just a moment and talk about some of the containers we see. And I, I know that there's a lot more to EMDR than resourcing, obviously, but for my audience, that's where a lot of people are, is they're just right. learning what the heck is going on, you know? Right. So yeah. I just wanted to say that you can make your own container right now. There right. are more special pieces that we would do in an EMDR container specifically, but 
it can be anything you want. My clients have come up with a range of, I would love to hear yours too, Amy, a yeah. range of containers. One was literally a duct tape box named Bob. Yeah, that's great. Bob got there and got it done versus another person who is more like a OCD and I'm not diagnosing. I'm just saying yeah. like more fastidious. This person had like multiple systems to get in and out of the box. It was coated in metal. It's got a library system inside, <laughs> you know, it's right. very organized. And my container initially was like the brig on a Star Trek series, force fields, yes. you know, yeah, so whatever you can up, get. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes up for you is the right container. Right. I agree. Is yes. And I've also have? had, I've also had um, clients, you know, that the number one thing I hear is Tupperware. I don't know what it is. It's like, they just picture a Tupperware container and which is really funny or a jar, but then, you know, you have clients that are really creative and, and to have a um, treasure chest and with all the locks on it. And then I've, I've had a lot of clients that have set a genie in a bottle where it's like anything just wants to get, you know, pulled into it. And, and so it's, it's really client specific and they can, they, their imagination just lets them do the work. It does. And imagination is a powerful tool. So one of the reasons I'm describing this is that if you think what your box is in your mind is silly or your container, it's not silly. Exactly. It's the right one. Your body and your brain are telling you what you need. I so, so, um, okay. We've got about 10 minutes left for yeah. this, um, episode. And I, I would just love to turn it over to you and say, what do you think people specifically with complex trauma might yeah. need to know about EMDR or how they would benefit from EMDR. Yeah. When, um, I think that the, the clients with complex trauma that really um, looking into EMDR is that not only resourcing, but also have that therapeutic relationship with the clinician. And so as they go in um, gently, you know, we're looking at the right brain to right brain connection um, and right brain psychology is huge. They've, you know, that's the creative side. And, you know, with EMDR, I think them, I think one of the most important things too, is to remember that we all want to get through, we all want to get through to the other side. And just like in REM sleep, where your eyes are moving back and forth, right? We are created that way. Our eyes are moving back and forth, but you don't get to choose what you're processing when you're asleep. So with EMDR, you get to choose, you get to make a target sequence plan. You get to go through, it's a three pronged approach. So it's past, present and future. And you just, you can do a chronological um, target sequence plan. You could do multiple issues. You could do a genogram. You can do belief focused. Um, so there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different ways you can create the target sequence plan to know the incidents that you want to process. You don't have to go into the deepest one first. I often do a top down approach, which is the future first, the present, and then the past. Mm. Also, you have the clients that come in that we call the crisis of the week, right? And so in order to get through it, maybe do a CID, which we can maybe talk about another time, but the CID um, is uh, helps them to ground. It's a grounding technique in order to get back on their target sequence plan that you've already developed. So, and then one of my favorite things in EMDR is installation, you installing the adaptive belief. So with that phase, it's really about getting the adaptive neural network on going on board. If that's, if that's how you want to say it, it's, you know, it's really about igniting that adaptive, you know, as an example, um, there, you know, the, the most common negative belief is I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want it to be polarized and just say, I am good enough. And you can say I'm good enough regardless, or I can learn that I'm good enough. And a lot of clients are, they have such an anemic, um, adaptive neural network that you have to just kind of put in words until they, they, they can make it possible. So with some, it's like, I'm trapped and helpless is a negative belief. Mm. So a pause adaptive belief was I can get my needs met regardless. Well, if they say I can't get my needs met, then you say, well, okay, I can begin to imagine that I can possibly get my needs met. And then they're like, okay, I can go with that. 
And so during that installation phase, my favorite thing is to watch clients notice what that and notice that adaptive neural network coming on board. Uh, and so they just all of a sudden come alive and they'll say things like, oh my gosh, I can see myself at work on Monday. And then that goes right into a future, mini future template. So I just say, okay, go on, go into your um, work on Monday, um, your hold on to your adaptive belief, play it like a movie and go with that. And so a lot of clients will come out just really encouraged for not only the processing that they had, but also going into the future so that they can get through their week. They can get no, not only through their trauma, but that they can start to live the yes. life that they want to live again. Totally. And I love that installation process too, because that's where I really start to see clients. I already see it in them. Clients feeling good enough and confident and competent to just right. do life. Yes. And yeah. And those of us with complex trauma, especially from childhood, we are mm -hmm. really geared to see things from a negative core perspective because we were taught that. Right. Right. And yeah. so I just wanted to check in with you real quick that when we're saying things like resistance or avoidance, those sound mm -hmm. negative, right. but the, the, the stance of EMDR is like, well, they're harming you now. Right. right. Because it's not working anymore, but we actually have gratitude for the things that got you down the road and to being right. here now. And so I just, uh, sometimes I hear people say EMDR can be kind of critical of self beliefs. Mm. I think that's practitioner oriented personally. Right. Yes. You yeah. agree. I agree. Yeah. And I think that, um, when it comes to utilizing those things that, I mean, every client that you see, is trying to get through their life the best they possibly can. Yep. Everybody wants to heal. And one of the reasons that EMDR works is called the AIP. So it's adaptive information processing. So you, every brain wants to become more adaptive. We want to heal. Our, our bodies are created to heal. And so, so is our mind. And so all those, all the people listening when it comes to complex trauma, it's, there is hope. And there is healing. And the most important thing is to just keep going, mm -hmm. keep showing up, keep working and, you know, find an EMDR therapist that you, that you trust and that you really fit the, the right fit is out there for everybody. Yeah. You know, Amy, I say frequently that when you're looking for a therapist or coach or other, you know, complementary alternative medicine practitioner, that finding the right fit is crucial, not only because you want a competent and ethical provider, right? right? But that connection that we have and the mirroring or the reflecting of each other that happens in it, that right brain to right brain connection, yes. you know, that is crucial to the healing too. So if you were going to say your therapist should have one quality. I know that. So I'm putting you on the spot with that, but okay, what yeah. would be like the ideal thing for people to look for? And then after you say that, yes. please let us know how to get a hold of you if people yes. want to do training or have support. So the number one thing is attunement. I attunement on authenticity. So when the client is attuned to, or the therapist is attuned to the client, both of the ways, then they can really help the brain move forward. I love, I love, I love the concept of, you know, initially it's opening up the mind of, is this personal to me? Do, are they understanding me? Do they connect with what's important to me? And then the next phase is, is it good? Is it bad? Is it scary? And so you want to be able to connect them with it's safe. This is a safe place. You know, securing your space is another resource because you want the client to feel that they are in a safe place because real work happens when they attach. So the next phase is attaching so that you can really get the good work done within that. Um, not only what we talked about with window of tolerance, but true healing and moving past the window of tolerance so that they can have that joy, that connection. The, to be the person that they want to be again. And some people I've had clients that walk out and say, I don't even, I can't even believe what's happened to me and how different I am from the beginning. And, you know, EMDR isn't for everyone. So I don't want it to seem like that, but it is, it's applicable to across the board. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 
I totally agree. Amy, thank you so much for your time. How can people get in touch with you if they either want to work with you uh, clinically or if they want maybe to talk with you about training? Yeah, absolutely. So my email address is long, but easy. It's choice counseling associates at gmail.com. So that's the best way on email. And, um, and I would just, I would love to hear from anybody, any of the feedback, as well as just connecting because I do uh, consultations with therapists to for certification, coaching, basic training, as well as, you know, and I'm an EMDR therapist myself. So Anyways, it's awesome. All right. Well, we'll make sure to put that email in the description below. I really appreciate your time. We're at the end of our session, our time today. Our time is up today, Amy. (laughs) Um, Thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Thank you.